Hello and welcome to video 28. In this question, we're going to combine the concepts of momentum and energy in terms of a collision. But it's not a collision like you normally think of. This is what I call an explosion, even though there's no fire, smoke, anything like that. We have two masses, M1 and M2, that are compressing this spring here that has a spring constant with a value K. So there's energy stored in the spring. Then we release this, and we assume that all of that energy that's stored in that spring goes into the kinetic energy of both of these objects after the collision, and the spring is at its rest length, storing no energy. Now, momentum is going to have to be conserved because there's no outside forces. These blocks are, for all intents and purposes, just in space. Uh, there's no friction, no drag, anything like that. So we're going to conserve momentum, and we're going to conserve energy when we do this problem. So let's look at uh, momentum first. Momentum conservation tells us that before the collision, there is no momentum. Nothing's moving. So the M1 V1 here, after, has to have a magnitude of momentum that is the same as M2 V2. Now, normally I like to put primes after velocity, but because there's no velocities before here, I'm just going to leave it as V1 and V2, and it's just one less thing to write. It's also going to be true that the uh, kinetic energy before is going to be zero, but the potential energy stored in the spring here, one-half kx squared, is going to be equal to the kinetic energy of both of these combined. So one-half m1 v1 squared plus one-half m2 v2 squared. So let's put these on the other page where I've got a little more room to write. And what we have here are two equations, one from the conservation momentum and one from the conservation of energy. So maybe that wasn't actually faster than rewriting it, but we'll see. Okay, we have two things we don't know, V1 and V2. This is a familiar game. We have two equations and two unknowns, simultaneous equations. So we're going to get rid of, again, not the mafia way, V2. So I'm going to solve for V2 in terms of the other things. And that's going to give me that V2 equals M1 over M2 times V1. Keep that on the side for a moment. We're going to look here at the uh, conservation of energy. There's a half everywhere, so those cancel out. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this in for V2, because again, this is equivalent to V2. I can write it in its place, and it means the same thing. That's what the equal sign means. So rewriting the first part stays the same, kx squared equals m1 v1 squared plus m2. Now when I square this, that's going to be m1 squared over m2 squared v1 squared, or m1 squared over m2 squared times v1 squared. And when you look at this, what I like to do is see that you have m2 on the bottom, m2 on the top here, so I'm going to cancel this M2 out and one of these M2s. Uh, I always prime here because I already mentioned that. I'm not going to be writing that. Uh, squared. And we can see that we can add these two terms together. And that's going to give us kx squared equals m1 plus m1 squared over m2 times v1 squared. Now what I want to do is I want to uh, get v1 squared by itself. Actually, to make the algebra a little bit uh, cleaner, I want this to be grouped together. So remember, if I multiply this by m2, divide it by m2, that doesn't fundamentally change it, but it means I can add them. 
so I can write it as kx squared equals m1 m2 plus m1 squared over m2 again times v1 squared and that makes it easier when I uh, multiply m2 to the other side divide by this and you get v1 squared equals m2 k x squared over m1 m2 plus m1 squared or taking the square root of both sides you get v1 equals the square root of this stuff. So we now actually have an expression that will give us the velocity of the first object after the quote unquote uh, explosion. To get V2, there's a symmetry argument that lets you get it quickly, and then there's the algebra way, which isn't too bad either. Uh, and I'll show you both of those. So let's plug in this back into here. And uh, what we're going to do is, well, I'll, I'll write it all out. So M1 over M2 times V1 is, don't forget the square root, M1 M2 kx squared. divided by m1 m2 plus m1 squared square root. Now remember I can actually bring this into the square root if I square both terms. So I'm going to erase this square root and I'm going to square both the bottom and the top and then that allows me to put both of those underneath the square root. Don't forget. Like that. Now let's see if there's anything that will cancel out. Notice this M2 will cancel out one of these. Uh, we can cancel out one of these M1s with this M1 and this M1 and bring this M2 in here multiplying both terms with it and what you wind up with is that V2 equals, so on the top m1 k x squared. On the bottom I take this m2 times both terms, so I multiply it in. m2 squared plus m1 m2 take the square root and that gives us the equation for velocity too. Something very interesting if you look at this is we actually could have gotten this without having to do the algebra once we know this. Because there's nothing fundamentally different about object 1 and object 2 it makes sense that if you switch all the 1's and all the 2's, uh, you should get the same answer. So if we were to make this V1 and V2, notice everywhere that you see a 1 on this side, you see a 2 on this side. So M1, M2, M1, M2, or BM2, M1, same thing. M1 squared, M2 squared. So by symmetry, you, you'd get the same thing. But I thought I'd show you the uh, algebra way. And so let's see what happens when we plug the numbers in and get actual values, because that's what people like numbers more than letters in my experience. So V1 is going to equal M2, which was uh, 4 kilograms, times the K, which I gave you was 10 newtons per meter, times the X, the distance that it was compressed, was 2 meters divided by m1 times m2, so that's going to be 8 kilograms times 4 kilograms plus 8 kilograms squared. Don't forget the square root, and you should get a velocity for object 1, sorry about the bell, that gives you 1.29 meters per second. Now, Here's an interesting math fact. When you take the square root, for example, if you take the square root of 4, most people assume the answer is 2. But another option would be negative 2, because negative 2 times negative 2 is also 4. Similarly here, we're going to take the negative root. And when you look at the picture, we know that object number 1 goes to the left, so it would be a negative velocity. So that's V1. When we plug in V2, the mass 1 is still 8 kilograms, 
times the k, which is still 10 newtons per meter, times the x, which is 2 meters squared, over m2, which is 4 kilograms squared, plus 8 kilograms times 4 kilograms. Take the square root, and because it's going to the right, we're going to take the positive root, and that gives us a velocity that um, is 2.58 meters per second. Now let's look at the time that it takes for this quote-unquote explosion to happen. And it sounds like a question that we wouldn't be able to answer until you look at it in terms of impulse momentum. Recall that impulse has two definitions, mass times change in velocity and its force times time. Well, if we take object one, for example, that's going to be equal to m1 times the change in velocity, uh, 1, and that's going to be equal to the force times the time. Well, the change in velocity we already found, but what about the force? How do we know what that force is? And by force, we mean average force. Well, let me remind you that for a spring, when you look at the force and the distance x that it's stretched, you get a linear graph. That's Hooke's law. The slope of this line is k. Remember that f uh, is going to equal k times x. So the average force is going to go like this, is going to be exactly half that. In other words, the average force is going to be equal to kx divided by 2, or the final point minus the initial point divided by 2. So the average force is going to be kx over 2, and we can use that to our advantage. So when we plug in here, it's going to be m1 delta v1 equals kx over 2 times t, or t equals 2 m1 delta v1 over kx. So when we plug in the numbers, 2 times the mass 1 is 8 kilograms, times the change in velocity is going to be negative, uh, rather, uh, so negative, negative, 1.29 over k, which is 10 newtons per meter, times the x, which is 2 meters. When you plug all that in, that's going to give us 1.03 seconds. So it takes 1.03 seconds in order for that uh, spring to uncompress. A conceptual point I want to make here is that the impulse both objects receive is equal and opposite. It has to be in order for momentum to be conserved. In order for the momentum of the system to stay zero afterwards, any impulse in the negative direction that this receives has to be balanced by the positive change in momentum here. Because you can't touch one object without touching another object that's simply not possible, this spring must be touching this block for the exact same amount of time that it is uh, touching this block. So as soon as you stop uh, pushing it, uh, it can no longer uh, accelerate it. So the force and the time are the same but obviously opposite directions for both objects. Running out of time here, a couple things I just want to say quickly to notice, if the masses are the same, as you would expect, they have equal but opposite velocities. If you have one mass that's huge, well, that mass hardly moves at all, and the second one moves a lot. Looking in terms of energy, if there's a big difference in mass, it's going to be the smaller object that's going to bear most of the kinetic energy, and the smaller object's hardly going to carry any of it. Also of note is if uh, you change the distance that it's compressed of the spring in the beginning, it actually does not change the time that it takes uh, for that spring to uncompress. It does, however, change the amount of energy that's stored and the velocities. This can actually be shown algebraically. We don't have time, but let me show you what you get. This interesting result matches the spreadsheet I just showed you and shows you that the time depends only on the masses and the spring constant. It does not actually depend on the x, which is a little uh, counterintuitive. 
I would not expect you to have to do this on a test, but it's just really kind of interesting. Thought I'd show you. Running out of time. Hope this helps.